everyone. I'm Becky Stichetti. I'm going to be the moderator for the panel tonight. Um, first thing I'm going to do is, well, actually, first, a huge thank you to Scrappers Film Group and um, Truthout.org and also Media Burn and Music Box Films or Music Box Theater for hosting this tonight. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing the panel in order that they're sitting so you guys know who's talking. Um, First to my left is Jerry Boyle, a civil rights lawyer and the host of our show that we just watched. Um, next is Tom Weinberg, a documentary filmmaker and founder of the Media Burn Independent Film Archive. Next to him is Kristen Knoll, a longtime activist around policing issues and the creator of the Women's All Points Bulletin. And then last is performance artist and activist Ricardo Gamboa, who has done years of radical and critically engaged art in Chicago and was also featured in the episode. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a few questions just to get things started and then um, I'm gonna open it up to questions from the audience. It's really meant to be a dialogue, so I really encourage you to um, ask questions if you have them. So first let's start with, um, Tom, that was the film, uh, he's the filmmaker behind the film that we saw first um, of the recording of the arrest at the Jane Byrne um, Easter celebration. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, like set up that, um, what it was like for you filming that scene a little bit, sort of like what type of equipment were you using, what was getting access into that police station like, and then we're gonna sort of shift into how it's changed with the role of technology changing, um, how it's, you know, challenges and um, also like what makes it harder and what makes it easier now to film police versus um, when you were doing it. And then also what year was that? Um, is this working? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was 35 years ago, I think. And the, obviously nobody had, we were the only ones with a the camera there. Um, and we were there because we had, we were there because we had heard about it and we wanted to be there. Uh, which really has to do with bearing witness, in a sense, right? Um, how has it changed? We all know how it's changed. We all have it in our pocket, right? I mean, this is not, and the, the whole thing of, of um, that we just saw, which is strength in numbers, is a, that you were talking about, is really, it, you can't get away with stuff in any way you, that you could. There was a moment in that um, the, the thing we just saw, in the video we just saw, where I wasn't sure, and Tom Finnerty, who was shooting it, was with me, um, what was going to happen, because they were starting to put everybody into the wagon, right? And then you could sort of hear or sort of not hear, but what he said is, if you don't move, you're going next. Well, at that point, you have to deal with it, right? You have no choice but to deal with it. And we said, well, the hell of them, we're, we're here, <laughs> you know? Um, and they didn't put us in the wagon. And, and, and um, I, I'm not sure, I suspect it would be different now than it would have been then. We were very close, there wasn't much space. Everything was going on. We were the only ones in the middle of it. So I think it would have been very, there are a lot of things that would be very different now, obviously, and that's why we're here. Um, describe like what type of camera you, you were using and what that looked like, and then also what type of camera you were using and what that, like how big was it? Uh, well, I didn't. In the, in the protest that you were filming, what type of camera were you using? I, I'm not sure. I mean, there weren't, it wasn't huge. Right. Right. There okay. were probably a hundred people there, or something, something in that order, maybe 150, not much more. So you brought up a point about um, the gap between, you know, and this was brought up in the film as well, about the gap between uh, what the law allows for and then also how things play out when you're actually on the ground. Um, how, and this is sort of for like 
our panelists at the end. Um, how has this kind of played out for you guys and your experience? I didn't hear, I'm sorry. What is it? Oh, it's for um, the two at the end, sort of how the gap between um, what the law allows and then um, what the actual experience is on the ground. Oh, well, ahead. you know, there's such thing as street policing, right? You know, what's practical, you know, or the practice compared to the policy and the procedure, right? So you always have to deal with the fact that this is uh, based on the personality of that particular police officer at that particular moment, right? And the circumstance that he finds himself in or she finds him herself in and whether or not they're going to respond constitutionally um, uh, based on your human rights, you know, uh, civilly, you know. Um, so my experience is, my personal experience is when um, I had my incident with a police officer, I wish there was video, you know. Um, and it was easy for there not to be video because um, he didn't turn it on. You know, he, um, I'm not sure if a lot of people know, but video on the cars is activated by the lights most of the time. So when the, the lights come on, the video is constantly um, filming. And when the lights come on, that tells the video to go back about a minute and then start um, downloading the video to the CD. And that's the way it, it used to be. Um, he never put his lights on. So there was no video of the attack. So you have to deal with that as well. You know, you have police officers who have body cameras, and I think it was just in the paper that a lot of them aren't turning on their body, body cameras or they're turning them off. Um, so on the street, you know, it is really a lot of times up to the us, you know, because you can't trust that the police officers are going to film based on policy and procedure. Yeah, I mean, is this working? No. Hello? Hey, hey there we are. Um, I don't know, I think that any, like, I, I think any young person of color learns uh, by the time they're 18, if you're growing up in Chicago, that as much as they're called law enforcement, what they are is law exempt. Um, and that at any point, right, at any point they can um, act in the name of the law in ways that are uh, presumably totally unlawful, right? If the law is supposed to secure freedom, they can always act with violence, right? And so I think part of what how, how policing works is police as an embodiment of the state, right, and of state power, also as a pedagogical function. And part of that not letting you, right, or being able to at any time disrupt you, you framing them, you recording them, is about how the state will always reserve the right to frame discourse or frame itself um, and will expropriate the everyday individual in concentric circles of marginalization from their ability to counter frame or frame at all. So from your experience, Ricardo, and then maybe Jerry can talk a little bit from the police perspective, what are ways to, um, a couple of them were addressed in the film, but ways to uh, approach filming police um, that is safe and successful and how do you deal with tension when it, when it does happen when you are filming the police? I mean like this, I think on, on one end, I think you know, capital or power will always find its limit against an organized body of people. And so kind of always that, that power and numbers thing is, is what's happened. I think a lot of the work, this country has like a beautiful history of performance art, right? Like it's founded by a bunch of like white people dressing up as Native Americans and like, you know, throwing tea off the harbor. Um, they're not so uh, friendly about performance art when it's uh, critiquing them. But I do think that that, uh, that that type of symbolic representation or that type of cultural activism does provide a certain buffer um, and comes off to them less um, oppositional and, and threatening on a lot of levels. Oh. 
the point you just made, I mean, as a practical matter, you can get away with a lot more if you call it art as opposed to making it political. And even if it is political, you still you, you characterize it as art. And I thought it was kind of clever that you guys did that in, in one of your videos. Um, uh, the, the cops respond to art with the, the concept that, well, I don't really know what's going on, but I'm not supposed to mess with it. Whereas if you come off it as explicitly political, they, they have a different attitude. One of my rules of street politics is you can get away with murder in the name of art. Um, you mentioned uh, art as one tactic, and I'm wondering if in your experience or um, anyone's experience here on the panel, uh, is there a tactic or is there any difference, um, you know, based on the identity of the person filming? So um, male versus female and how that physical pres presence changes, if at all, the way uh, police react to it or, um, you know, ethnicity specifically as well. Absolutely. I mean... Uh I talked a little bit about how the first level of the use of force is physical presence, and just like cops wear uniforms, I mean, how we present ourselves um, uh, determines how they're gonna respond to us. And you can dress in ways that, that project power, um, or you can dress in ways that provoke a response from power. And I mean, the, the, the bottom line is a, a corn-fed white boy in a jacket and tie is always gonna get away with more than, you know, um, you know, an African-American kid with a t-shirt that says, fuck the police. Um, it's a, they send different messages, they project different aspects of power. Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting is like, the amount of times that I've been approached by police and they just see like this like short, small, like puffy around the edges Mexican kid that they're just like, you know, they, they could dismiss this whole country, right? Kind of thinks as Mexicans as like the, the, the non-threatening, but you know, this, this sustainable, the, this minority that can always be a beast of burden in certain ways. Um, but then the minute they find out that I'm queer, Right, like how it, it, it becomes like this immediate threat to like their masculinity and it, uh, it kind of incites a whole range of kind of like uh, microaggressions to like outright hostility. When that cop came when, and you know, when the police officer started opening up the, uh, the garage when we were protesting, I mean, I did it later, but one of the things I wanted to be was like, say out loud was like, oh man, that cop is hot, you know? <laughs> but I was like so worried in that context that it would kind of like uh, incite some type of reaction from him and I thought, you know, Better to kind of just be chill at that moment. It's interesting because that was one guy, right. and it was relatively easy to comply, and right. there was no threat exactly. Lots of times, when there's lots of cops, it's a game. Mm -hmm. And that's where there are, I mean, I say gang in the, in the you know what I'm saying. <laughs> well, the police are really just the toughest gang in town. It's, it's a fair characterization. Yeah. Um, and they got the guns. Yeah, and the most technology. Right. Um, yeah, speaking from the different layers and intersectionality, right? You know, um, I'm a black woman, right? So what does that mean to a white male? Cop. You know, uh, and so if you add on the next layer, I'm a black woman protester, right. you know, and, you know, you find yourselves in these situations and for safety purposes, uh, and I think I'm answering your question, you can correct me if I'm wrong, for safety purposes as a black woman, I know, as a woman, I know that I am not as threatening to a male as a male, right? Um, as a black woman, I know that there's that layer on top that I can get away with things that women can get away with, but not necessarily what, quote unquote, black people can get away with. So that's where, you know, it gets a little, you know, gray, right? Um, but as a protester, now, you know, now I have to deal with whether or not he's gonna be or she's gonna be PO'd because I'm a protester and they're tired and they feel as if they're being attacked and there's a war on the police and blah, 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 blah. Um, or whether or not they're that police officer who really, really feels constitutionally that he has a responsibility to protect my right to protest. So you've seen police officers and many pictures of uh, people who are right here on a police officer, right? 
you know, and he's like, okay. <laughs> no, I'm gonna let you get right there in my face and I'm just gonna stand there and be cool, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, then you have that police officer who will pick you up and slam you face first and head first into the ground because he feels as if that's just a little bit too close, right? Um, so as a woman, I know that I can get close, but as a woman, because of, you know, when you talk about police officers, a lot of times you hear the terms power and control, right? So when I was doing research on uh, violence against women, because there wasn't really anything on police violence against women back in 2009 when I started. So I just Googled power and control, and what came up was domestic violence. And I went, oh my God, this is what they're about. They're about power and control, and when you Google it, violence against women comes up. You know, so with that being said, that taught me that, you know, as a woman, I still have to deal with gender-based violence. And so I stay on top of that in my head and I keep my distance, you know, knowing that at any point in time, that particular piece can come into the picture and I could be in harm's way. Uh, one little tactical thing I should point out, uh, getting in a cop's face is always dangerous, unless... You're going to kiss him. Uh, well, no, I no. mean, no, I mean, <laughs> you can get away with that at a big protest downtown because, I mean, the police command understand that there's, their guys can be real thugs. So at these protests, they flood the whole area of our operations with brass. So the boss is there. And when the boss is watching, they tend to be better behaved. Um, so don't get the wrong idea. Um, you know, the, uh, out in the neighborhood, you get in a copper's face, you're going to get your ass kicked. Well, they, they even in that um, Trump rally, they, a guy got in their face and they picked him up, threw him into the ground, busted his head, and knocked him out. So, you know, it happened. And at the point you made about skin color, I mean, one of the people who got brutalized by the police there was a, a CBS producer. Um, who's detailed to the to the Trump campaign, and he's always getting grief. Why? I, I forget. He's either, I think he's um, uh, Muslim or or Hispanic. But you know, these cops just jumped him for no good reason and charged him with resisting arrest. They just tackled him out of nowhere. Um, that actually brings up. <laughs> that brings up the next question that I had for the panel. Um, some of you who may have varying levels of um, experience with this, but uh, the idea that these types of uh, police videos are fueling movements um, like the Black Lives Matter and other protest movements right now um, in Chicago and nationally. Um, so just, I know in the video we watched, um, uh, a technique or strategy offered was to have an app that sends your video automatically um, somewhere in case your phone is confiscated, but I was wondering if you, if any of you wanted to talk more about, you know, videos like the Trump rally um, or the Eric Garner death um, and how that can be used to uh, create social change. I, I can't say tactically it's a really good idea to have one of those things that uploads your, your video right away because, I mean, I have seen people who were arrested and when they get released from the lockup and we, we get their, their property, um, the first thing I always tell them is turn on your phone, see if they still got SIM cards, and sometimes they don't. Um, so the, tactically the autom automatic uploading app is a very good idea. They, they do care very much about those videos, so much so that sometimes they'll arrest you just to take your SIM card. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that is interesting, right, is like I think that that type of, tech, that type of video technology is really awesome and really useful in terms of creating a certain type of critical mass on the side of the people, right, that can maybe launch. But I think also one of the things, again, like thinking of the police and the state as always operating in a pedagogical way, how in a lot of those cases, right, the footage actually didn't create through the legal apparatus the change that we were hoping that type of footage would do, right? You can, you, they might not indict the cop for anything, right? Like, it, they, they can find a way, the way to discuss it. And so, in this other way, kind of what, what, what are the two sides? Yes, it can create this critical, this type of critical mass and, and circulate awareness, but then in this other thing, how the state will try and teach you, right, that it doesn't matter, 
right? That, that, your, that your attempts uh, to try and frame them will sometimes be futile and that they will continue to kind of uh, push that threshold of tolerance uh, for as long and as much as they can. And so I think that to me, as much as, you know, there's a lot of hope that becomes available through, through this type of, you know, the, the, the means of mechanical reproduction, there's also a lot of despair that comes with how even that, uh, in the face of, of you know, with, with all the rational explanations, um, can still sometimes not be adequate in combating through the system we're supposed to rely on injustice and violence. A perfect example is Eric Garner. Every, everybody saw that video, everybody knew it was wrong, but the cop beat the rap. Uh, legal system failed to deal with it. It was the people out on the streets that dealt with it, the protesters. They're, they're the only ones who actually made any kind of social change on that. The legal system was totally worthless. One piece which I can talk to for 30 seconds is we're, we live in Chicago, or I do, um, and we have, we've been dealing with the Chicago police for a very long time, and they've been dealing with us. Um, if you go to a New York rally, you go to a Washington whatever, rally protest, there is a different underlying feeling with the police. They're a lot more sophisticated about it. I'm not necessarily saying they're gentler or that they're smarter or a lot of things, but it's a different attitude. You, you... A absolutely, I always warn activists when the, the uniforms change, so does your risk profile. Each, um, each police department has its own culture. And when you get used to Chicago culture, you've got to be careful when you encounter another because they, they have a different culture and a different set of rules they follow. I, I guess that's all I'm saying. They do have a basic underlying racist culture, though. So Absolutely. You know, <laughs> well, Here. You always, across the country. Um, the, uh, well, we have to go back to 1996, I think it was, when Rodney King was uh, videotaped and uh, we all saw that and um, one of the things that we learned from that because right after that the federal government uh, gave millions of dollars to have um, do I keep not doing that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the federal government gave millions of dollars to put um, video on police cars. Okay. So um, what a lot of people don't know is that the Department of Justice loves video, right? They love it. So when the state did what you expect the state to do, which is say, oh yeah, the police officer didn't do anything as far as we could see, you know, the DOJ immediately, within hours of them saying that they would not indict Eric Gardner, jumped and said, we got this, okay? Um, in 1996, with the video where the four officers got off from the state, right, and the rioting started, well, the DOJ stepped in there, and then they put, I think, two of the four officers in jail. And a lot of people don't realize that two of the four officers went to jail for the DOJ. Another thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the DOJ is the next step, right? Um, if the state is not willing to charge criminally, then the DOJ can charge at the criminal, at the civil criminal level, you know? And we're trying to get it where, you know, at some point in time, the United States will allow for it to be uh, additionally a human rights violation. But taping, you know, like you were saying, um, we see what we see, and when we watch it, we see and we take it in from a human point of view, right? We're watching and we're like, where's the humanity and what we saw in the Eric Gardner case. Where's the humanity? That just doesn't make any sense, right? That he could come up behind him and choke him to death and then all of them could jump on top of him and he's screaming out, I can't breathe and they don't care, right? Um, so we see it from that point of view. But when the state gets to it, the state starts putting the layers on top, right? Well based on the policies and procedures of the uh, police department, you know, he was resisting by using his voice, 
You know, a lot of people don't realize that you can't resist arrest by talking, but the police, once again, is a street, right? Street policing. So when it goes inside the court systems, the court systems start laying on all these policies and procedures that are really just really bad, you know. Um, and then our response, you know, is uh, visceral, right? We're like, oh my God, how could that happen, you know? Um, so with that being said, the, the, the other part of this that I would like to just address, I remember a long time ago when I was in my 30s, which is a long time ago, um, I watched this film, I think with Barbara De Niro, and it was called Snuff, I think it was. And it dealt with um, him running around trying to find his daughter or something, and him getting into this um, um, underground filming of people being killed right, and how there was this market, and it was called snuff films. Well, now snuff films have come into our everyday lives. We are watching filming of black bodies, brown bodies, white bodies, being killed by the police, and we're actually asking for them, right? We're like, we want to see the video. You know, we want to see Laquan McDonald get shot 16 times. Release it, release it for the world to see. You know, and it's at what point do we realize that we've stepped into a realm of watching people die and how they want, it, it's, it's as if it's a conspiracy to desensitize us to watching death, real death not the movie death, but real death. And we watch it from the point of view of a movie. Oh, wow, he was shot 16 times. Oh, okay. You know, so I, I, I wonder why these films aren't just for the families to see. And it, it's, it's, I wonder if it's setting us up for some major war that's going to go on on our streets and we're going to be able to watch people being killed and shot and death and we're going to be okay with it. Wow. Well, I think that's one of the things that, I'm sorry, that was one of the things that I wanted to bring up before we kind of moved on to a question was the notion of grievability, right? So, so much of like what this gets folded into is like this, these certain type of conversations of like oppositional politics or resistance in law. I'm not relying on the law to, to change, not even through the power of people oftentimes, right? It, it, it didn't, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, uh, it was provisional change in 1960, you know, in the, in the 1960s. But one of the things that I do think about, right, is the ability, is grievability, right? Right? So as opposed to being desensitized, how do these, uh, which, which is what I, I agree, which, which, which is what I think is happening, how can these also become opportunities on the, on the part of the people to, to reconnect with right, the, the, the value of a life as opposed to like this kind of type of uh, thrilling media consumption, right? Because we weren't able, right? There would be bodies hanging from trees in, in, the, in the 1800s, right? And Jim Crow segregation uh, lynched. And there was never ever the ability to to grieve those bodies, right? And so one of the things that I think, um, if there if there are redeeming effects of the of the reproduction, the mechanical reproduction of of racial slaughter, is that how can it how can it connect us to humanity um, and to the ability to grieve these bodies that have been expungible throughout time, rather than um, to view them as a certain type of entertainment that, that you're talking about? Let's. I'm just gonna pause because I want to make sure that we have time to get to audience questions and um, experiences. So if anyone has, yeah, okay. Thank you, so the question was for Jerry, um, essentially, are we moving towards a situation where it's going to be harder to prove um, a situation if there is no video? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, you can always prove a case with testimony. Uh, the question is whether or not it's gonna be believed. Um, and on the one hand, um, the ubiquity of videos of police misconduct uh, has an effect on the jury pool. Um, it, um, uh, juries tend to give the benefit of the doubt to the coppers, but after you've witnessed uh, a bunch of videos um, in the media where cops are doing bad things and lying about it, uh, it makes it a little bit harder for a jury to give the benefit of the doubt to the cop. 
Um, it's always better to have documentary evidence, um, but on the other hand, you can always prove your case with testimony, with what comes out of your mouth. And also, you can prove it with um, injuries. So pictures, so the Department of Justice not only goes by video, they love, they love video, but if you have injuries, if you have a broken nose or cracked skull or something like that, they'll, that is a dead giveaway, so to speak, of um, what they like to call excessive force. Thank yeah, you. As a, as a practical matter, it's, it's not supposed to be a legal matter, but as a practical matter, the way um, brutality cases works out is the, the jury's really not supposed to give the benefit of the doubt to the cops, but they do. And the jury's really not supposed to give you any credit because you've got broken bones or a smashed up face, but they do. They're human beings. Jim, did you have a question? Uh, you're absolutely you taught me that, Jim. You're absolutely right about that, and for instance, something that people miss all the time is the Illinois eavesdropping statute has nothing to do with video. It's all about audio. Um, it's the conversations. And then with the Laquan McDonald video, it, it, I don't think it was any accident that the audio didn't work on any of those police cars. I think they all intentionally disabled them. Because that's always the fight, right? He said, she said. So if you don't catch what is being said, if you don't catch that violent speak, right? You know, the, the racial, you know, um, epitaphs that can be thrown around, right? And you just have somebody saying, I heard him say that, instead of having the video, uh, the audio. It, it just, it, it makes that difference. So yes, audio, you know, it's very important. And on a lot of the police cars, they don't have audio with their video. Yeah. So you get these silent, you know, um, uh, pictures, you know, and it's, it's crazy because you have to bring in the, you know, the captions. You we know, do. So. We have a question, um, just to repeat the question really quick so everyone can hear it. Um, when you call a police, um, Okay, when you call the police station or news affairs, are you allowed to record that conversation over the phone and do the eavesdropping laws? Um, I wouldn't record anyone over the phone without their explicit permission on the tape. Um, telephone, somebody calls you on the phone, your reasonable expectation is that you're talking to one person. And even if it's a police officer doing his or her job, it's not crystal clear. But that's actually exactly what the eavesdropping law was designed to prevent, um, was recording telephone calls. So I, I would not do that without their consent on the tape. Okay, let's do one more. I'm going to go with Phil over here. Go ahead. Okay, so the first part is, um, is there a collaboration between the press with cameras and the police, and do citizens have to combat that? Absolutely. Wait, Jerry, let's start with it. If you guys, sorry. Well, I mean, I think we're talking about two things, right? We're talking about power as a multi-sided thing, right? That there's like the, the power of like the, the government, there's police, there's also corporate power, there's, there's the power of those who can frame discourse, right? Who can frame consciousness like through media. And I think that it's, it's really clear, right? We see, uh, we see in, in a variety of ways how that's kind of been been conditioned, right? So everywhere from the, the fascist Nazi state, right, their, their appropriation of media to the uh, corporate performance of liberal democratic but capitalist fascist state, which is called the United States and their appropriation of, of corporate media. Um, and so I think though, you know, and, and so the idea, right, is can individuals, right, is, is individual, the job of the individual to intervene, right, to democratize that right or to popularize it, right, by kind of doing this counter surveillance or this counter, uh, counter in, in information dis dissemination. And to one end, yes, but I also say to what end, right? So a lot of times, again, how those, how those things have been circuited or routed has been, you know, back into the court, fold, trying to fold it back to petitions to the state. And I think one of the things that I'm asking in my own activism and in my own practice and in my own art and in my own struggle to like know what it's like to be alive and provisionally free is um, are there any ways that we can use that information in creative ways to start different conversations or different types of mobilizations that don't just fold us back to begging freedom from a state that has not yet given it to us. 
Um, and I think that's kind of one of the things that, that I'm interested in because really, I'm so sorry for taking, let me just take 10 more seconds, but it's how power always affirms itself, right? So these videos that we're constantly taking and circulating, uh, they don't just possibly work at the desensitization, but they're also economic, right? Like they provide content on Facebook, they provide content, right, for all these different people that, where all of our clicks count, right? And, and they equate to profit or, or, or ways of knowing the people. Um, so I guess, and when we talk about policing and their ability to frame or, or, or keep things out of the frame, we're talking about working in, in darkness and opacity and, the, and secrecy, right? And so what, what advantage do we, can we, how can we use, right? How can we also use those same tactics uh, amongst ourselves and, and in our own activist work? I love the thing about um, express your First Amendment rights over there, right? <laughs> I mean, hello, That's, we don't need to know any more than that. To answer your, to answer your question. The, um, the, the, just going back to the connection between lynching and lynching then and lynching now, there was a buildup in the media, right? The Laquan McDonald tape is going to be released. Well, that's what they used to do with lynchings, right? There's going to be a lynching on this day at this time. The Laquan McDonald tape is going to be released. He's, we're not hanging from trees anymore. We're being shot down in the street. That's the media. That's the economic side. Ooh, we're all waiting for the Laquan McDonald tape. We're going to click and watch it over and over and over and over again, right? Uh, additionally, when there was, when there, it, since the Betty Jones and Quintonio LeGreer shooting, it's been rather quiet. But if you remember, what's Pat, Pat Mc, Pat, the, the guy who used to always um, explain, oh, Camden, Camden um, used to always explain how the shooting went down. Did they go to the community and have a community spokesperson to say, well, that's not the way it went down on our side, you know, but Pat was always out there, you know, oh, it was a justified shooting and it went down like this, and the media would stop. It wouldn't say, okay, here's the other side, you know, it would be Pat. So yes, they, um, they support you know, the police by deciding what you know, is the narrative that's going to put forward to explain the violence that they've committed in the community. Jerry, did you want to add anything? I, I just put it real bluntly. There's, a, there's an unholy alliance between the mainstream media and the cops. The cops give the media their spectacular headlines. In return, the, cops, uh, the, the media serves as a, as a megaphone for whatever the cops want to say. It's that simple. It's also the press pass. Well, they get privileged access, too. But they get access at all. So the question was, how can we ensure that the media that we're producing is um, used for social change versus feeding into uh, an entertainment machine? And then, um, and then final thoughts as you're answering this question, because we have to wrap it up. I think it's the pivot, right? Like who, like who are we? Who are we presenting that media to? And I want to, and, and I'm saying this because I think so much of how we have been conditioned to think about things. Again, power will always affirm itself. As it is the active force, right? We are the reactive force. And so I think when we think about that, who we always petition to, who we're always pivoting to is power right so we're always like we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna post this and we're, we're gonna show it to the man and you know and, and so we're all in certain ways that that reify reify the system and reify the man right very seldomly right did we take that did anyone think to like take these certain videos and, and go from classroom to classroom or, or block to block right or think of these different forms of dissemination right or grassroots how they can be used in grassroots organization outside of the purview of power, because you cannot touch what you cannot see. And so, you know, what, what type of radical imagination can social media and the ability to catch cops, right, afford for us in, in, uh, in, in terms of being able to think about how to, how to resist in, in new ways? And I think a big part of it, right, is that we always want to move into the light move into the spot, like move into the spotlight, right? Or, or, the, or bring truth to light. Um, and they don't work like that, right? The CIA headquarters is in Langley, uh, is in Langley Virginia, right? It's, it's, it's like this very, uh, it's a whole city where it's kind of just a very secret, open secret. 
Um, and how do we create our own open secrets? How do you make film of death not entertaining? You don't show it. Because we will always find some entertainment value in watching, you know? Um, has it made change? I don't want to sound so bleak when it comes to the protest and people standing up for what they believe in and us trying to exercise our rights. I think Pete Seeger said, you, the only way you know you have them is, is if you try to exercise them, right? Um, that's a hard question because we've turned violence into entertainment. You know, uh, 48 hours we watch over and over again these violent acts against women and men across the country. We watch cops and that's violent and we watch, uh, what I just saw Spectre and you know, we, we are constantly inundated with violence and that violence is revolving around death. People being shot and killed. We get to practice it in video games. You know what I mean? Like, and it's actually legal, and it's right? it's people. Like, it's not, you know, when Doom came out, you were shooting monsters. <laughs> now, you, you know, you're running down people. You're, you're killing them in video games. And these are our children. You know, not only being taught to, you know, target the head of the person in order to get more points, um, but actually teaching them how to shoot. Some of these video games actually have the guns. So I... I the only way it's no longer entertaining is if we stop making it entertainment. Tom, do you have anything to add? I pass. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think I can improve on what she said. I mean, it, 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 that's a whole business that is too much for right now. <laughs> well, um, a <laughs> huge thank you to our panelists for coming out tonight, and even bigger thank you to all of you for coming out. Um, there will be one more in this series of Rights Lab at April 20th at Comfort Station in Logan Square. So be sure to check it out. Um, this episode will go up online um, right after. <laughs> Yana's feeding me information. So this episode will go up online right after the screening. Um, share it with all your friends. Um, and then we'll see you on April 20th. Thanks.